London, the 5th of April, 2020. For three long weeks, the coronavirus has brought the streets of the British capital to a standstill and enveloped the kingdom. During her 68-year reign, the Queen of the United Kingdom has only intervened on television four times. This was to be a rare, historic and solemn speech. That evening, as night fell, Elizabeth II addressed her people. I'm speaking to you at what I know is an increasingly challenging time. A time of disruption in the life of our country. Together we are tackling this disease and I want to reassure you that if we remain united and resolute, then we will overcome it. We will succeed, and that success will belong to every one of us. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. The next morning, a glimmer of hope shone over London. 24 million British people had watched the speech on television. There were record viewing figures around the Commonwealth too, from Australia to Canada. And in Europe, several million people had tuned in to hear the Queen's message. Such is the mysterious power of this unique modern day monarch. And yet at the age of 94, Elizabeth II had just lived through one of the worst years of her reign. The pandemic was the finale of a long drama. She almost lost her husband, Prince Philip. She got caught up in an unprecedented political crisis. She had to renounce her son, Andrew, when he was suspected of sexual abuse. She saw her grandson, Harry, and his wife, Meghan, go into voluntary exile in America. Ruptures, scandals, Brexit, and loneliness. But Her Majesty remained unshakable, impervious, and unfailing throughout. This is the story of Elizabeth II's last battles. The Duke of Edinburgh has been involved in a car accident near the Sandringham Estate in Norfolk. Prince Philip, who is 97, is not injured. Our Royal Correspondent Nick Witchell is with me now. Tell us what we know, Nick. This happened at about 3.30 this afternoon on the A149, close to the Sandringham Estate. The Duke, who was driving himself, was pulling out of a driveway when there was a traffic accident involving another vehicle the Range Rover that the Duke was driving turned over. According to an eyewitness, the Duke was conscious, but he was very, very shocked and shaken. When she was informed of the accident, for a moment, Elizabeth II thought that she had lost the love of her life, this unwavering companion who had been her only refuge for over 70 years. This was a recurring nightmare. The Queen had been trying to persuade her husband to give up driving for some time. Would this accident finally convince him? Not at all. Two days later, a photographer for the Mail on Sunday, one of the most powerful British tabloids, caught Prince Philip on camera behind the wheel of a new Land Rover. And what's more, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. He had re-offended. Not only did he drive out of Sandringham House where the photograph was taken two days afterwards, he wasn't wearing his seatbelt. He was a man who'd caused a very dangerous car accident with two women and a baby in the back of the car. It looked as if he just didn't give a damn. And frankly, knowing what we know of Prince Philip, I don't think he did. This time, the Queen's husband was forced to hand his driving licence over to the police. Was that the end of it? Not really. Since the law permits it, the very next day, Philip got behind the wheel of another vehicle 
and carried on driving around the grounds of his castle. While her husband continued dicing with death, Elizabeth II returned to her duties as queen, as if nothing had happened. A visit to RAF Marham in Norfolk. Handshakes for the men and warm smiles for the female officers. Mission accomplished, as usual. What is the Queen thinking about as she leaves the airbase? She gives nothing away. No one really knows what goes on in the Queen's head. And yet, every evening for the past 70 years, she has kept a diary which every historian in the land fantasizes about reading. We can only imagine what it might contain. That evening, despite her husband's recent accident, no doubt the Queen wrote a few simple, factual sentences the words of a conscientious, industrious queen pin of the royal family. Devoid of inner torture or soul searching. I think the queen has feelings, but the queen was born into this strange um, life where she never really had a private life. So she was brought up believing in, in duty, believing that she didn't have the luxury of her own feelings. She spent her whole life suppressing her emotions, hiding her emotions from herself, I think, as well as from other people. The second chapter of this drama begins just days after Prince Philip's accident. Still on the hunt for juicy tidbits, the British Red Tops came up with another spicy morsel to sink their teeth into, the princess's duel. According to the tabloids, a furious row was unfolding behind the walls of Kensington Palace, where the wives of the Queen's grandsons, Princes William and Harry, both lived. Meghan had got rid of all the staff, Kate couldn't deal with the fact that her sister-in-law had fired her loyal servants. Kate, the epitome of discretion. Meghan, the hysteric. Spot the misfit. Stories come out of her, some would say, difficult behaviour. There were stories that Meghan didn't really want to do things that, as the royals had done before, there was nicknames for her in the palace. Um, me again, because it was all about her. And I think public opinion was starting to turn. She was this divorcee, American woman, actress, who come in and stolen a Prince of England. <laughs> Meghan Markle came from another world. She was American, an actress, divorced, not to mention mixed race and a feminist. I'm a California girl, born and raised, so I, um, the flip-flop culture is part of just who I am. I love my cutoffs and flip-flops and being as relaxed as can be. Oblivious to the prejudices, Elizabeth II was convinced that the transition from Hollywood to Buckingham Palace was possible and that the arrival of this emancipated modern woman would give the British monarchy a much-needed facelift. To boost the image of the firm, the Queen, the day after her grandson's wedding, took Meghan with her to the county of Cheshire, north of Liverpool, to take her first steps as a member of the royal family. The American actress and the British monarch seemed to be hitting it off. 
despite her age and her heritage, the Queen is a real modernizer and they, she knows how to stay relevant. And she knew that embracing this new, very glamorous, very diverse character made the monarchy more relevant to more people. And that was good for the monarchy. The British tabloids may have chosen to take issue with Meghan, but Elizabeth II wasn't wrong. The British youth applauded this modern princess who challenged outdated traditions. It was as if history was repeating itself. Quarter of a century after the death of Diana, the United Kingdom once again witnessed the arrival of a princess with a difference, one who was independent and rebellious. Diana meekly endured the diktats of the royal protocol for years before she finally asserted herself. Meghan was much quicker off the mark. Prince Harry's wife broke with the long-held tradition of all royal pregnancies becoming public affairs. When the time came, Meghan spurned the royal family's preferred clinic and gave birth on the quiet in a relatively unknown hospital in Central. And after the birth of Archie, this mixed-race princess ignored the sacrosanct ritual usually bestowed upon every new young prince. Traditionally, he would be presented to his royal subjects via the media as soon as he left the maternity ward. One of the reasons Harry and Meghan refused to introduce their son Archie to the public was doubtless this tweet posted by BBC News presenter Danny Baker just hours after his birth. It was the culmination of latent racism shown towards the couple in the media and on the web. I know that Meghan and Harry perceived a lot of racism, particularly in the commentary and the columns in British newspapers. When you see headlines like Straight Out of Compton and talking about her exotic DNA, yes, I mean, you're... Well, Straight Out of Compton was wrong. It was factually wrong. And, and describing someone's DNA as exotic is... is separating them. So, yes, um, perhaps there has been s racist undertones in the coverage. In the past, I think the tradition would be to ignore that sort of stuff, but they refused to accept that and they um, would block accounts, they would spend a lot of time um, looking at trolls online and trying to prevent them from spreading their hate. A fortnight after the birth, on his grandmother Elizabeth II's insistence, Harry finally introduced his newborn son to the voracious lenses of the royal press. Congratulations. Thank you. But if certain reactionaries in the kingdom were impatient to find out whether Archie looked more like his mother or his father, or to put it bluntly, whether he was black or white, they might as well have spared themselves the trouble. Who does he take after? Does he look like anyone? We're still trying to figure that out. Well, everyone says that babies change so much over two weeks. We're basically sort of monitoring how the, uh, how the changing process happens over this next month, really. <laughs> but he's his looks are changing every single day. Yeah. So who knows? Can we have a little peek at him? We just can't quite mm -hmm. see his face. Oh. Wow. This was a skeleton service. The rift seemed final. That evening, alone in her room, the Queen must have felt anxious. Meghan had failed to understand that being a member of the royal family meant making sacrifices. These conventions could serve as armor rather than censure once you worked out how to use them to your advantage. Her grandson's wife 
reminded her so much of the Princess of Wales. She was radiant and generous, just like Diana. She loved being in the spotlight, but hated being photographed by the press, just like Diana. The Queen sent up a prayer, remembering her daughter-in-law's divorce and brutal death. Dear God, spare me another tragedy. The Queen's Gambit was foundering, but the soap opera wasn't over yet. A new perilous chapter began ten days later. On the 24th of July, 2019, former London mayor and Conservative Party troublemaker Boris Johnson paid Elizabeth II a visit for his first private audience as the new Prime Minister. During her 67-year reign, this was the 14th Prime Minister the Queen had received and nothing had changed, with bowing and scraping from one side and diplomatic smiles from the other, as usual. Elizabeth II has always kept her distance from government leaders. She has never become friends with any of them. She belongs to a world which has no use for politicians. As far as she is concerned, they are birds of a feather whether left-wing or right-wing. She puts up with them, safe in the knowledge that such is the life of politics, that they will come and go, whereas she will always be there. Prime Minister Boris Johnson does not govern by consensus and compromise. He has a rough-and-ready approach to achieving his goal, which is to leave the European Union as soon as possible. He plans to get the country out of the stalemate it has been stuck in for the past three years. The day after his audience with the Queen, in his first speech to the British Parliament, Bojo goes in, all guns blazing. Our mission is to restore trust in our democracy and fulfil the repeated promises of Parliament to the people by coming out of the European Union and doing so on October the 31st. Confronted by a hostile Parliament, Boris Johnson simply bulldozes his way through. The great Brexit divide that started off as Leave versus Remain is finally coming down tonight to government versus parliament with the people and the Queen caught somewhere in the middle. To cheers from his supporters and howls of outrage from opponents, the Prime Minister announced this morning that he was suspending parliament for longer than usual. In the hours following the announcement of the suspension of Parliament, thousands of anti-Brexit demonstrators converge on central London. They accuse Boris Johnson of having taken the Queen hostage in a hostile takeover. Indeed, it was Elizabeth II who signed the decree, which is both her prerogative and her duty. Boris Johnson said, I want to prorogue Parliament, I wish you to just sign the document of prorogation, and the Queen signed it. Constitutionally, the Queen is guided and advised by her Prime Minister and her ministers. Now, if her ministers say it is OK, she has to accept that. Um, that is our constitution. The Queen never feels manipulated by politicians. They all try to manipulate her, but she doesn't let herself be manipulated. If she had said to Johnson, listen, this decree is intolerable, Johnson might have amended it, but she clearly didn't do that. While there was turmoil on the streets of London and the political classes were debating her role, active or otherwise, in this unprecedented suspension of Parliament, the Queen took a trip 400 miles north to her holiday home in Scotland, Balmoral Castle. 
On the agenda were bagpipes and the stroking of ponies. But behind Her Majesty's silence, some people detected a deeply held conviction. What if, in her heart of hearts, Elizabeth II was actually a Brexiteer? She is a country girl at heart, who is secretly suspicious of the pro-European stance of the metropolitan elite. After all, she is head of the Commonwealth, her extended family overseas. In her eyes, the destiny of the United Kingdom lies more with those former colonies and ex-Dominions than with the European Union. For all that, the Queen seems to me to be pro-Brexit, although she has never actually said so. I would never guess what the Queen is thinking, whether she's pro or, or, or anti-Brexit. Nobody will really know what her thoughts are about it, because she will not talk about it for fear of it getting out. And getting out then causes a constitutional crisis, and she's not in the business of creating constitutional crisis. But despite Elizabeth II wanting to avoid it at all costs, the constitutional crisis was a reality. And in London, some of the demonstrators also thought the Queen knew exactly what she was doing when she signed the decree muzzling the anti-Brexit parliament. In mid-September, the Supreme Court, the country's highest judicial body, settled this toxic debate. The decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful because it had the effect of frustrating or preventing the ability of Parliament to carry out its constitutional functions without reasonable justification. Prime Minister Boris Johnson had broken the law by asking for the suspension of Parliament. It was unprecedented in the modern history of the United Kingdom. The ball was in the Queen's court, and it was against her religion to intervene in politics. She may have been put in a position where she had to choose an alternative prime minister, or the leader of the opposition would have said, you have to appoint a different government or sack that prime minister. And that would have been the worst case scenario for her. She wouldn't have wanted to get involved. Three weeks later, at the Palace of Westminster, the Queen's speech was ceremoniously delivered. Elizabeth II had not changed Prime Minister. Boris Johnson's head did not roll. Every year, in accordance with royal protocol, the monarch, dressed in all her finery, opens the parliamentary session reading out her Prime Minister's programme to some 650 MPs and peers. My Lords and Members of the House of Commons, my government's priority has always been to secure the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union on the 31st of October. On that day last year, Elizabeth II looked to be having a particularly bad day, her brows knitted in a frown and a grumpy expression on her face. The Queen seemed to be weary of all the conflict and intrigue that were inherent to her role, not to mention the unpopularity that went along with that. Good morning. This is an NBC News special report. NBC News has learned that disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein is dead. Epstein took his own life while he was behind bars here in New York City facing charges of sex trafficking. Whilst in Great Britain, the Queen was caught in the political crossfire of Brexit. On the other side of the Atlantic, in the United States, a tornado was unleashed, which was to shake the crown to its very core. On the 10th of August, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was found hanged in his prison cell in Manhattan. The early noughties, Jeffrey Epstein had been one of the most highly rated financial advisors in America. 
its wealthy Wall Street enchanterer was also a dreadful sexual predator. Jeffrey Epstein was recruiting underage girls, often ones who were destitute and who had lost their way. Under the cover of massages, he was forcing them into prostitution. At that time, the two-faced financier counted Prince Andrew, the Queen's second son, among his celebrity friends. Andrew had been introduced to Epstein by Ghislaine Maxwell. As well as being the billionaire seducer's official partner, Ghislaine was also one of the prince's long-standing friends. Somebody like Epstein is enormously attractive to somebody like Prince Andrew. And Prince Andrew will have been um, impressed by him on so many different levels, you know, seeing him as this sort of sophisticated man of the world, seeing him as somebody who could give him a lifestyle he wanted. On the 17th of August, 2019, eight days after Epstein's suicide, the Mail on Sunday's website featured these shocking images taken in December 2010 in New York. They were filmed whilst a case was being brought before the American courts against the financier for procuring a child for prostitution. They show Jeffrey Epstein leaving his private mansion in Central Park, accompanied by a young girl who is obediently following him. A few minutes later, Prince Andrew is captured accompanying a young girl to the door. His Royal Highness has been caught red-handed and is clearly involved in a toxic friendship with Epstein. Prince Andrew said that he went over to stay with Jeffrey Epstein uh, in 2010 because he wanted to end the relationship, which is absolute nonsense. He probably, silly enough, thought, oh, I'm going to do something about it. I'll go to New York. I'll go and stay in his house for four days. I'll go for a walk with him in Central Park and say, sorry, our friendship's finished. It's it's naive, it's arrogance. I mean, what's wrong with an email or a telephone? Um, I mean, the man's a complete fool if he thinks that he's gonna get away with uh, a senior member of the royal family being photographed in Central Park with a sex offender. By the end of that summer, the revelations were coming thick and fast. The British press published a new photo taken from the FBI's case file showing Prince Andrew with his arm around the waist of a young blonde girl who was employed by Epstein at the time. The pressure was mounting. During these dark days, perhaps the Queen struggled to keep her diary. What could she write about? Her disappointment? Her sadness? No, what haunted Elizabeth II during this moment of intense loneliness? What tormented her most was the poison of guilt, doubts about her own life. The Queen wondered whether she had sacrificed her own children on the altar of the monarchy and her duties, whether she had been a good mother. What drives Queen Elizabeth is not power per se. She is not a political woman. What drives her is the burden of duty. She has not been a good mother. She has been indifferent because she sacrificed family life for her duties as a queen. She is an excellent grandmother because by now she has got used to the job. But she was a terrible mother. Doubting is a weakness, whereas duty is a strength. At the start of September, forgetting Andrew, who was wavering, Elizabeth II sent Harry and Meghan on an official visit to South Africa. The couple's mission? To fly the flag for the United Kingdom on the other side of the Commonwealth. Harry and Meghan's African adventures were followed by more than 11 million followers on their Instagram account. 
The Queen's strategy of modernizing the image of the British monarchy across the Commonwealth seemed to be working, thanks to the smile of this mixed-race princess. But Meghan and Harry weren't just there to represent the crown. They had their own scores to settle. In a new act of defiance to the British tabloids, the royal couple brought their son Archie into the spotlight for the first time. They went to introduce him to Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a hero of the battle against apartheid. So Archie was white after all, but Meghan's message was black. This trip also allowed Prince Harry to get another message across, the one dearest to his heart. Harry is, above all else, his mother Diana's heir. More than 20 years earlier, the Princess of Wales, by now separated from her husband Charles, came here to Angola. She intended to draw the attention of the world press to the tragedy of landmines abandoned in former war zones around the world. A year after Diana's visit to Angola, the UN banned the use of these landmines, which had killed numerous civilians. But still some remained, and Harry wanted to take up his mother's crusade. The world became a better place thanks to you, Mum. But the prince's pride hid a deep wound, caused by the brutal death of his mother in a car accident in Paris, while she was being followed by a horde of paparazzi. Harry was just 12 at the time. Confessions. Being here now 22 years later, trying to finish what she started, um, yeah, it will, be, it will be incredibly emotional, but everything, everything that I do reminds me of her. Um, but as I said, with, with the role, with the job, and the, and the sort of the pressures that come with that, I get reminded of the bad stuff. Every single time I see a camera, every single time I hear a click, every single time I see a flash, it takes me straight back. So in that respect, it's, it's, the, it's the worst reminder of her life, as opposed to the best. Unfortunately, I don't know whether there's a little bit of worrying about your wife being under the same pressure as your mother was under. I think, for me, and for, and for my wife, you know, there's a, there's a, of course, there's a lot of stuff that hurts, um, especially when the majority of it is untrue. Um, but I will, you know, I will not, I will not be bullied <laughs> into 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 playing a game that that killed my mum. On the last day of the African visit, it was Meghan's turn to unburden herself. Her gripes mirrored those of her husband. Being a modern-day princess was clearly an ordeal. I had no idea, which probably sounds difficult to understand here, but when I, um, when I first met my now husband, my friends were really happy because I was so happy. But my British friend said to me, I'm sure he's great, but you shouldn't do it because the British tabloids will destroy your life. And I very naively, I'm American, we don't have that there. What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. I'm not in tabloids. I didn't get it. So it's, um, yeah, it's been complicated. We must be seen to be believed. At the start of October 2019,
this maxim, so often repeated to members of her royal family, was going round and round in the Queen's head. For Elizabeth II, Harry and Meghan's declarations were a sign of weakness and self-indulgence. The press was a necessary evil for the royal family. Elizabeth II recorded her vexation in her diary. Either that, or worse still, her inability to steer her grandson and his wife back onto the royal path. For Elizabeth II, however, the worst was still to come. Disgrace. Far from the United Kingdom in New York, Virginia Roberts, a spokesperson for all of Jeffrey Epstein's victims, agreed to be interviewed by the BBC. She was the girl Prince Andrew had had his arm around on the photo released by the FBI. Virginia Roberts was just 17 when she was recruited by Epstein. A teenager on the wrong path, she became the billionaire's sex toy for three years. Epstein shared her with his prestigious friends, one of whom was Prince Andrew. How many times did you have sex with Prince Andrew? There was three times. And where, where, where was that? Um, Gillen's townhouse in London, Jeffrey's mansion in New York, and Jeffrey's island in the Caribbean. Gillen tells me that I have to do for Andrew what I do for Jeffrey. And that made me sick. It was disgusting. He wasn't mean or anything, but he got up and he said thanks and walked out. And I sat there in bed just horrified and ashamed and felt dirty. And I had to get up and go have a shower. And you know, the next day, Guilen tells me I did a really good job. You know, she pats me on the back and said, you made him really happy. It was a wicked time in my life. It was a really scary time in my life. I had just been abused by a, a member of a royal family. Recorded in New York in mid-November, the interview with Virginia Roberts was due to be broadcast at the start of December. When Andrew found out, he panicked. Without informing his mother, the Queen, he decided to grant his own interview to the BBC on the condition that it be shown before the interview with Virginia Roberts. The interview with Prince Andrew was broadcast on the evening of Saturday the 16th of November, live from Buckingham Palace, which was deserted since it was the weekend. July of this year, Epstein was arrested on charges of sex trafficking and abusing mm -hmm. dozens of underage girls. Mm -hmm. One of Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yep. has made allegations against you. She says she met you in 2001, she dined with you, and she went on to have sex with you in a house belonging to Gerlaine Maxwell. Your response? I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. None whatsoever. You don't remember meeting her? No. That couldn't have happened because the date that is being suggested, I was at home with the children. You know that you were at home with the children? Mm. Was it a memorable night? On that particular day that, that, that um, uh, we now understand that is the date, which is the 10th of March, uh, I was at home. Uh, I was with the children. I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking for a party at, a, I suppose, sort of four or five in the afternoon. Why would you remember that so specifically? Why would you remember a, a Pizza Express birthday and being at home? Because going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. A very unusual thing for me to do. She provided a photo of yes. the two of you together. Yes. Your arm was around her waist. Yes. You've seen the photo. I've seen the photograph. How do you explain that? I can't. Because I don't, I have no, I, again, I have absolutely no memory of that photograph ever being taken. Do you recognise yourself in oh, the photo? Oh, yeah, it's 
pretty difficult not to recognise yourself. So it's possible that it was you with your was, arm around That's me, but, but whether that's my hand or whether that's um, the position, I, I... But I don't... I have simply no recollection. No. I wonder if you have any sense now of guilt, regret or shame about any of your behaviour and your friendship with Epstein? Do I regret the fact that, that, that he has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming? Yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite, in the sense that he was a sex offender. The following morning, the British press laid in to Prince Andrew. Not one single word of remorse was the headline in the mail. The Metro went one step further with Duke of Porky's, the Duke had a pizza alibi, was the ironic headline in the Sunday Times. He not only blows it up um, for himself, but what he does is he reminds people of all of the worst things about monarchy, of all of the venality, all of the stuff that is old fashioned, backward looking. He said that he wouldn't have noticed all the young women around Epstein because they were servants and he didn't notice servants. And I mean, imagine that, imagine growing up in such a way that you are actually blind to the people around you, that they become like this chair. There was consternation at Buckingham Palace. The ladies in waiting averted their gazes. The advisers made a beeline for the exit. Elizabeth II was furious. When the Queen heard the reports and subsequent news bulletins uh, about the interview, she was not just shocked, but she was angry. Angry that someone in her own family, her son, had let the side down, had let the team down uh, and brought shame. And off the back of that, she took the decision, and a very tough decision, to effectively fire him from the royal family, strip away everything that he'd been involved with. <laughs> Andrew was encouraged by his mother to commit harakiri. I have asked Her Majesty if I may step back from public duties for the foreseeable future, and she has given her permission, wrote the Prince in a press release. Classic Elizabeth II. The Queen is an authoritarian figure. But her genius throughout all the crises she has faced during her 68 years on the throne has been to not show that. Once the Queen became aware of the scale of the scandal, like an iron hand in a velvet glove, she got rid of Andrew. But the next day, she put on a show for the photographers and accompanied him to church. At the end of December 2019, one month after Andrew's media suicide and his banishment from the royal family, Elizabeth II gave her traditional Christmas speech, broadcast across all the television channels in the kingdom. Millions of us sat transfixed to our television screens. During her speech, in which she mentioned the first man on the moon, the Normandy landings and the birth of Jesus Christ, Queen Elizabeth, in one short sentence, alluded to the successive challenges she had faced that year. With small steps. The path, of course, is not always smooth, and may at times this year have felt quite bumpy, but small steps can make a world of difference. But alas, the Queen had not come to the end of this bumpy path. The drama continued into the new year. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have announced that they are carving out what they call a new role for themselves. In a statement released in the last few minutes, they say they intend to step back as senior members of the royal family and work to become financially independent. 
the spectacular departure of Harry and Meghan shook the institution of the monarchy to its core. The modernization Elizabeth II had wanted had proved to be a time bomb. Symptom of a global era dominated by social media, the couple broke the news on their Instagram page. We now plan to balance our time between the United Kingdom and North America. The decision took everyone by surprise. Harry and Meghan didn't wait for a green light or even inform the Queen before their press release. In any negotiation, you do it behind closed doors. Then we present united fronts to the outside world, to the press. Harry and Meghan did the complete opposite. And as an aide said to me, it was as if Harry and Meghan had put a gun to the Queen's head. Ever since the death of his mother, Diana, Harry had been Elizabeth II's favorite. That made this all the harder to bear. I was told by a source who knows the Queen that the Queen felt monumentally let down by Harry and Meghan um, because she had gone out of her way to welcome Meghan to accommodate the couple and to give them the royal lives that they wanted. I was also told that Harry was behaving, quote, like a bolshy teenager. On the 13th of January, five days after the announcement of his voluntary exile, with Meghan and their son Archie already in Canada, Prince Harry was summoned by his grandmother for a crisis meeting on the Sandringham estate. The Queen called a family meeting to decide Harry's future. Harry, who is adorable but not very bright, didn't realize he had fallen into a trap because he was in a minority. He faced a united front, the Queen, Prince Charles, Prince William, the lady-in-waiting and the free private secretary. And he didn't have Meghan by his side. So the Queen was completely in charge of the situation. Harry had been ambushed. Behind the 100-year-old walls of Sandringham House, Harry pleaded his case. Duke of Sussex had hoped to retain his royal title and to carry on representing the Queen from America, which would have guaranteed him considerable clout for his various charitable projects. Fat chance. You can leave the royal family, but you've got to leave the royal family with nothing. Uh, you can't expect to be going over to the other side of the Atlantic and use all the trappings of the royal family to become in financially independent. That's not how the royal family works. You cannot be half in, half out. You're either in or you're out, but you cannot be both. And she was adamant about that. It was a tough stance, and it would have been difficult for her to take that stance with her grandson. But it was his decision to go, and therefore he had to suffer the consequences. Worried about her aging husband, destabilized by the storm Boris Johnson had whipped up, bruised by her son's behavior and abandoned by her grandson, Elizabeth II was having to roll with the punches. At the start of 2020, a recurring rumor had reared its ugly head as it had every time the monarchy had founded during the past 12 months. It was doing the rounds of so-called well-informed circles and pubs. Would the queen, inevitably shaken, weakened and weary, give up the throne? Anyone doubting Elizabeth II's obstinacy would have to rewrite the monarch's biography. There is a motto which has been borne by many of my ancestors. I serve. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. She committed herself in 1947. She committed herself in 1953 at the coronation. She's a very religious person. She's supreme governor of the Church of England, the ceremonial head.
She committed herself to God all the days of her life, which means until she draws her last breath. The last thing that she would do would be to abdicate. She will either die in the job or if she becomes incapable, there will be a regency until the point that she dies. As the nights draw in, Elizabeth II is reminded of the words she uttered over 70 years ago. I will serve. During her long reign as queen, many have wanted to make the decision on her behalf. No one has ever managed it, and they won't start now. Boris Johnson, Andrew, Harry, all these men have passed through with their blinkered pride. Meanwhile, she has remained. Will she abdicate? Never. What next? How to follow a living legend, this woman who has defied history. Charles I, then William. And then one day, young George will have to take up this seemingly impossible gauntlet. May God grant them strength. God save the Queen.